I'm an oceanographer. I'm in love with my planet. I think it's cool. And uh, when you compare it to uh, uh, the irony, here's the irony. We have better maps of Mars than of planet Earth. That's one irony. Number two irony, 50% of the United States of America is under the ocean unexplored. Half of our country has not been explored. Nuts. Okay, the, 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 the program that NASA has for space exploration is 1,000 times larger than NOAA's ocean exploration program. That's nuts. So there's a lot of nutty things going on. But our goal is to understand our planet and, and to change that paradigm. Now the problem we have is that it's easy in many ways in, 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 to go to the moon. You can actually go and walk around on the moon. I didn't go up there, they did, I was just with uh, Buzz Aldrin the other day, you can go on the moon and walk around. You cannot walk around on most of our planet. In many ways our own planet is somewhat more alien than the moon and that's because of it's covered 72% of it by water. And the average depth of the ocean is 12,000 feet down, the average depth. It gets down to 35,700 feet. The pressure in the Marianas Trench is 8 tons per square inch. You don't get out of your submarine. Bad idea. You know, do it once. So our mission is to explore our planet. And the problem is that it's very complex. I mean, we, we have this simplistic view that our ocean is this big bucket of water with a bunch of mud in it. And why do you want to go there? Well, wrong. The largest mountain ranges on Earth, the mid-ocean ridge, so it runs around the planet like a seam on a baseball, is the largest mountain range on our planet. We didn't know it existed when I was in high school. We did not go to the largest feature of our own planet till after they went to the moon. They went to the moon, they played golf up there before they, we went to the largest feature of our own planet. More importantly, our planet is alive. It is a, a living, as far as I'm concerned, a living organism we live on the back of. And along that entire 42,000 miles of mountain ranges that covers 23% of the Earth's total surface area are tens of thousands of active volcanoes. There are far more active volcanoes beneath the sea than on land. Periodically, they make their presence. The Earth is also extremely busy. This is a map of the last uh, 20 years of earthquakes on our planet. And you can see they are outlining the plates. And, when, and these plates have three kinds of things they do. It's real simple. They move away from one another, and that's what's happening along the entire mid-ocean ridge. Let me get my laser, Darth Vader laser pointer here. Along the mid-ocean ridge is where the Earth creates its outer skin through this process of plate divergence. So all along, this giant, whoo, burn the building here. All along, don't point this to anybody. Uh, don't mess around. I'm, I'm armed and dangerous. Okay. Uh, God, I think I'll get away from here. It's just frightful. There you go. Uh, so now I've got your attention over here, right? I told you I'd home in on you guys. So here's the mid ocean ridge. And all along that, my gosh, that's a laser pointer, whoo, uh, is where the earth creates its outer skin. But it's also here where the Earth is converging. And as you know, as we just saw, vividly demonstrated to us what happens when the Earth suddenly moves. And this is the, his plate tectonics in a nutshell. This is the mid-ocean ridge. And what happens along the mid-ocean ridge is when those plates separate, if you're a living organism and I cut into your body, what comes out of your body? Blood. When you cut into the Earth, the Earth bleeds its molten blood. That molten blood rises up from the asthenosphere at the base of the lithosphere, the rigid plus crust, comes from the interior of the body of the planet and forms new tissue. Now since the earth is neither expanding nor contracting but is in steady state, if I create new skin somewhere on the planet, somewhere else I'm consuming old skin. And that's what's happening in regions of plate convergence. In regions of plate convergence, that old skin literally recycles, goes back down inside the planet. That's why we don't look like the moon. That's why we don't look like Mars. We don't look like the recent shots from Mercury. We are a living creature that's constantly renewing its existence. 
through this process of plate convergence. But when it moves suddenly, it can generate tremendous energy. As we saw tragically uh, in Japan and before that in Indonesia, off the Indonesian plate, as it was, it suddenly moved 12 to 18 feet. And in the case of the Jap off of Japan, those, uh, during that period of, 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 of lockup, when you had the plates that were locked up and they were not moving, those plates are still moving behind us like cocking a spring. It's loading it. And in the case of Japan, the land was literally like when you shuffle cards of decks, just before the deck snaps, they're bent. And for hundreds of years, unbeknownst to the Japanese people, their land was rising because they were cocking the spring. And one of the accentuators of that tsunami's devastating effect was when the plate snapped, it literally went down and parts of Japan went below sea level. And that's why that guy got so far in. It literally, the land went suddenly down. And, and all of a sudden, land that they thought was above sea level is no longer above sea level. So that was the devastation of that. And as we saw, tragically still being acted out tragically with the reactors. So this is the bleeding earth. This is one of my favorite shots. This tells you a lot if you stare at it. First place, we know that the earth was approximately four and a half billion years old, okay? Four and a half billion, right? But this guy is in millions of years. So let's look at that scale. If you can see it in the back, I'll tell you, it's zero to 280, watch your ear, I'm about to burn it off, uh, 280 million years. Okay, 280 million years is just a little over one quarter of a billion. Well, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that the oldest ocean floor is only 280 million on a planet that's four and a half billion? To have this four and a half billion on this time scale, we're out the door and into the next conference room to get to four and a half billion. Does that mean that the ocean is young? No, it's been recycling itself. It's been recycling itself for, it, since its creation. The oldest rock we've ever found, actual rock is up in Greenland, is 3.8 billion years old. It's a sedimentary rock, there was an ocean. So we know that we've had an ocean on our planet for a long, long time, but we're recycling the ocean because when plates go at it, oceans lose. So let's back up to that. Why do oceans lose? Well, because if you go outside the countryside here and you pick up a, a, a bedrock, a rock that's a rock, an igneous rock or a metamorphic rock, you pick up that rock, and where I live, chances are you'll pick up a piece of granite. Okay, you look at the granite. Well, first place, it's generally light in color. The reason it's light in color is dominantly silica, SiO2, but it also carries a lot of other minerals like felspars. If you look at the composition of them on the periodic table, they're made up of the lighter metals. They're made up of sodium, potassium, and aluminum, okay? So if you take a quarter, let's say you took a piece of granite, cut it into a block of a cubic foot, and you put it on a waterbed. That puppy's gonna go down into that waterbed pretty far, right? But if you go out into the ocean and you pick up a piece of ocean crust, tends to be black in color, basaltic rocks, and if you look at its chemical composition, yes, it has a lot of silicon because it's the most common element in the universe, everyone's got that. But if you look at its mineral assemblages, the metals are iron and magnesium. They're uh, uh, farther down on the periodic table. They are heavier. So if I took a cubic foot of ocean floor and put it on the waterbed, it's gonna go deeper into the waterbed than the, ocean, the continental block. So the reason that their continents are up is they're simply floating higher because of the rocks they're made of, and ocean floor is made of a denser rock, so it sinks deeper. So whenever they go at it, guess who's in a position to go back into the earth? It's the ocean. And because of this, the real long-term history of our planet are on our continents, but I find our continents quite boring. They're sort of rafts drifting around, having things slugged into them. It's out in the ocean where the action is. Because when you get magma chambers, you get action and you have tens of thousands of magma chambers underwater, you get a lot of action. And so we began exploring that action years ago. Uh, we, we, we periodically see it come to the surface like you have in the formation of the Hawaiian Islands or the formation of uh, a lot of different hotspots on our planet, but Iceland, for example, sits astride of the Mid-Ocean Ridge. I'll be there in a few days and it's cooking still. 
Uh, now, in my early days of exploration, the only way to do it was to physically do it. Get in a submarine and go down. And this was the submarine I lived in for about a quarter of a century. They did let me out periodically. But, uh, but the problem is, is I'm going to an extremely bad place that wants to kill me, the deep sea. And I have to encapsulate myself in a little ball to protect myself from that external pressure. Temperature is freezing. So I had to encapsulate myself. Now here's the problem I had. The rate at which when I want to dive, I put weights on the side of my submarine because all I got is lead acid batteries. I got a little you know, golf cart batteries driving my submarines. I don't have a nuclear reactor. I have very, I'm very underpowered in these deep diving submarines. So I had to uh, put weights on the side of my submarine and flood my tanks. I get negative, I fall. The problem is the rate at which I fall is controlled by the coefficient of drag, which has an exponential function in it. So if I wanted to double my ascent descent rate, I had to exponentially increase my weight. I just couldn't get that heavy. So I reached a terminal velocity. I had to come to grips with the fact that I could not accelerate my ascent descent, and I lived with 100 feet a minute. Now the problem is 12,000 feet, that's two hours, then you add to getting ready, it takes me two and a half hours to get to work in the morning, and two and a half hours to get home at night. A five hour commute to work. How much bottom time? Not much. Three hours. So over the 25 years of doing this crazy thing, I sat down, finally ran some numbers, and I was averaging one nautical mile a dive on a mountain range 42,000 nautical miles long. Actually, 72,000 nautical miles. 42,000, uh, 72,000 kilometers, 42,000 nautical miles. So, Great job security, it's going to take me forever <laughs> to do this, but I'm a little more impatient. So I began to, to dream about a new way of going to work, to, instead of going down this way, physically going, but this is our first manned exploration of the Mid-Ocean Ridge. Finally, we got in submarines, in the, and I was one of the first, there's six of us, that got in submarines and actually went down into the biggest feature on the Earth, where the Earth creates its outer skin. And here's an artistic characterization of that, because a true picture would be completely black. Photons, which are particles coming off the sun, come into, from outer space, they cannot penetrate to the average depth of the ocean. Most of our planet is in eternal darkness and always will be in eternal darkness. Most of our planet, when you work, you work in the dark. Because of that, that photonic energy does not reach the surface of most of our planet. And for that reason, you cannot have plants growing on most of the surface of the Earth because they need photons. But that's what our biology book says. The base of life on our planet is the sun. Or so we thought. So we went down there, and naturally, when we first arrived, we said, that's cool. Uh, we're geologists, we hate stuff covering rocks, you know, we don't have any plants down there, and we get to look at the, up the barren earth, and that's, that's cool. And so we were exploring that, and we, we saw fish here, a fish there, but we know that they are dependent upon the energy of the dead animals living up in the sunlit euphotic zone. Those guys die, and their bodies rain down, we call it marine snow, and it takes, uh, it takes uh, a, a centimeter per millennium, so it's not a lot of snow, okay? But it accumulates, you add a few million years, and you'd be surprised. But anyway, when you got down there, we didn't find a whole lot of life. And that was cool. But then we realized that we were looking at all these volcanoes. These volcanoes, think about it. You can go through the North Pole, drill a hole, drop down, land in this mountain range and on an active volcano in the North Pole, and drive all the way around the planet, never leaving it go through the Atlantic, through the, through the Indian Ocean, through the Pacific, finally come aground in Baja, California, and you haven't left that mountain range, you've seen tens of thousands of volcanoes on the whole trip. So, we wanted to, we wanted to do that, but we also noticed that there were cracks. Well, obviously, you're pulling the earth apart, you're gonna have cracks. But we know that beneath every volcano, active volcano, is a magma chamber. And they're not far down, about 100, about a, a thousand kilometers down, or one kilometer down, about a thousand meters. And we know in a magma chamber, the temperature is 12 to 1400 degrees centigrade. That's hot. And we know the ocean is four degrees, you got a tremendous thermal gradient. 
and that's a driving engine. You have a high thermal gradient, you have a high in, uh, driving engine of, of pro processes. And, and we could actually see the active volcanism. It's, it's actually reasonably safe to get near them because there's so much pressure, they're not explosive and they don't have a lot of volatiles in them anyway. And still need to be careful. But we came across these giant black smokers. It was sort of amazing. See, we expected heat to come out, but we did not expect that. We did not expect to see chimneys of, of, of material coming out of the bottom ocean. And, and, and in this one expedition, we solved so many different issues. One of the problems we had prior to this expedition in 1977 is we did not know why the ocean was, had its chemistry. It was a, one of those embarrassing five-year-old questions. You know, why is the ocean salty? Go away, kid. You know, get out of here. You know, I don't know. And because the obvious candidate was rivers. They were dumping all the stuff in there. So we ran around the rivers and we looked at their chemistry and we compared it to the chemistry of the ocean, it wasn't the same. We had this mass balance problem. We had stuff going in the ocean that strangely disappeared and new things strangely appeared. Until we found these guys and we realized that in those cracks that we were looking at, water was going down those cracks to the magma chamber and interacting with the host rock at very high temperatures and trading things. I'll give you what the rivers gave me if you'll give me something new. And that new altered chemistry was flowing out of the ocean floor. Now, we called them black smokers, which was a big mistake because they have nothing to do with smoke. There's nothing to do with smoke. In fact, when you get up, when we saw one of these for the first time, we said, let's go find out how hot it is. You know, got to do that. So we go up with our submarine and we're looking out the window. We had a little heat probe and we put the heat probe in the top of that chimney and we're looking at our temperature gauge and it goes Pow! And our pilot makes this great scientific observation, that's hot, okay. <laughs> we then pull out the device and we're looking at it outside our, and the whole thing is melted. And the pilot says, you know, the plex, the window made out of the same stuff. The exiting temperature was 650 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead, let alone our windows. That was a dicey learning curve. But when we looked at the fluid itself, the first couple centimeters, it was a clear fluid. It was a clear fluid, and then it all of a sudden turned black. And what we were looking at was the, was a, the creation of minerals before our very eyes. In solution in that super hot water was amazing mineral assemblages that when they were quenched uh, from 650 degrees Fahrenheit to the ambient temperature of 4 degrees centigrade, it quenched. And what you're looking at is the formation of microcrystals of what are called polymetallic sulfide. Copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold in commercial concentrations. How much of that have they found on the moon? Okay? We're finding vast mineral assemblages along that entire mountain range. We've yet to develop the technology to mine it, but rest assured, our planet has a, a great inventory of copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold in commercial concentrations if we solve the engineering problems, which we will. But that discovery was eclipsed by this image. An incredible concentration of life forms that had absolutely no business being there. No business being there because there was no obvious source of energy. The biomass, the weight of these creatures, exceeded the biomass of the sunlit layer 8,000 feet above us. Four times more biomass, living tissue <coughs> around these black smokers than was living in the sunlit, euphotic, photosynthesized, driven world. And these were weird creatures. We'd never seen them before. Giant worms, two meters tall, sticking out their lungs their lungs, sticking out their lungs so that they can inhale something. We, we, and around these giant tube worms were giant clam fields. And these clams were really strange. Everyone knows what a clam looks like? Buckle up. Yes. Not only does it look disgusting, it smelled disgusting. It had a horrible smell of rotten eggs. <laughs> Smelled like rotten eggs. And then we dissected it, right? What do you do when you cut into a clam? What do you find? Well, maybe it's internal organs, right? Wrong. 
This clam did not have internal organs. No mouth, no gut, no digestive system. Its entire body had been taken over by another organism, a bacterium, that had figured out over eons of time how to duplicate photosynthesis in the dark through a process we now call chemosynthesis. And we now believe that this is the basis of life on our planet. So that those of you that have trouble being related to a monkey, try this. <laughs> not, only do we, not only do we believe it's the basis of life on our planet, we believe it probably came from outer space. And this is how planets reproduce. That's the sperm of Gaia. That's how planets reproduce. They're able to send off the trigger of life to other planets. And that's why we re-interest in outer space going to Mars. Mars used to have plate tectonics, probably had an ocean. It's now dead because it's not the critical mass of Earth. But it probably still has life within Mars. Probably if we drill into Mars, we'll find this puppy. And that's also focusing us on Europa, the moon of Jupiter that has an ocean. Learn about Europa, it's a cool place. But it's got an ocean maybe 60 miles deep with a canopy of ice, probably has volcanoes due to the distortional uh, rotation around Jupiter. It's being distorted and leads to volcanism like Io. Cool place to explore. Cool place to explore. Your, your generation will get there. But I, I, was, I was really getting frustrated by how I was getting to work. I was tired, I'm back on you here. I was tired of going all my time up and down in an elevator. So I published this article long before you were born in National Geographic magazine in the summer of 1981. And I said, you know, someday the day will come when we will not do this physically. We will have out-of-body experiences. We will, you're the generation of, the, of, 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 of spirit transport. Your generation will be initiating a whole new, your generation is going to do some wild things because you're going to live most of the time outside of your body. And you can do it by moving your spirit around. Your spirit has no mass. It's indestructible to move the speed of light. Your body is sort of so-so. You know. So the idea of this was to replace my physical presence with a telepresence initially on the surface of the ship, but then the heck with it, I'm not even going to be on the ship. And I have now implemented this technology last year. It took me 29 years incrementally building this technology, but we now have it all online. Okay? And we need your troops for it. So here's how the first app, this is a more modern version of it. The idea was if you can have a robotic system place your physical presence, excuse me, you don't need to bring it up. Put the vehicle down 24 7, round the clock, don't have to come up. Insurance policy collapses, all sorts of things happen that make this an economic way of going, but more importantly, you explore and you explore and explore. So, ironically, the first application of my technology was going after the Titanic. I thought it'd be cool. And we developed our first vehicle system was the Argo, this guy, with my laser beam here. Ooh, wow, okay. And the beauty of that was I could deploy it, not recover it, and I just tracked it down. It couldn't escape me. And we found it sitting on the bottom of the ocean, pretty cool. We went down uh, with our vehicle system, and I had a little prototype robot. I called it Jason Jr. Because I hadn't get the big one yet, I was parallel developing, always develop in parallel, never develop in series, you'll never get there. And so I made certain assumptions, the cable will come, the dynamic position will come, just don't worry about that, let's concentrate on our first little ROV. And we built our little ROV and it stole the show. And we went down the grand staircase and there it was, chandelier and all that sort of stuff. But what was interesting about it was the response I got from kids of your generation and that's what led to the Jason Project. I saw in my R2-D2s and CP3Os, you guys saw where we're going and you want to get in the game. I got 16,000 letters the first week I got back from that expedition and the letters all said the same thing. What do I have to do to do what you do? Study. <laughs> I took a quadruple major in college, math, physics, chemistry and geology, self-inflicted gunshot wound. But anyway, <laughs> I learned a lot, okay? And, and the second thing the kids said was, what, can I go with you on your next expedition? Sure can. 
Now, we can now take you on all our expeditions, some of you physically, I hope some of you in this room will come with us physically and be ambassadors, but we expect most of you to do it with your spirit. How are we going to do that? Well, here's some of our Argonauts that we take on our expeditions and we embed them in the program. We also do expeditions that are on, on the ocean. I happen to have a bias towards the ocean, but the Jason Project does an amazing series of expeditions where we take young people with us, we embed them in our team, we take teachers with us, and embed them in the team and have them reporting back. You become the ambassador. You become the role model, the, the role models we really need to have. You guys are all ideal role models for what we need for the, for the human race to progress. And then we have you reporting back. You'd rather listen to one of your classmates than me anyway. We have an amazing curriculum that we've developed. And it's not easy, but it's a lot of fun. It's got a lot of uh, gaming. We'd love to you guys to be, uh, do some of our beta testing for some of our games. I mean, we're right down the street here. And if you're interested, raise your hand over there. Go to them. We've got some cool games we're working on. Uh, we've got a neat ROV game we're working on. We're going to go to Europa and find hydrothermal vents. That would be really cool. So we're going to be gaming that. All sorts of cool things you can get involved in. And we've won all the awards you can win. You know, we win them all, all the time. So it's a great, great project. Now, let me tell you a little more about our live Jason activities. So we have our curriculum-based program. It's good stuff and all of that, but we also do the, the live stuff. I served on a presidential commission, and I got to write the recommendations, and so naturally I wrote, we need an invigorated program in ocean exploration. That was easy to write. And we need our own ships of exploration. So I then went and acquired two ships of exploration, go on the web, One's called the Okeanos Explorer, and the other one is Mind the Nautilus. Both of these ships' missions are to go where no one has gone before on planet Earth. Now, what's really cool about that mission is that makes it technologically interesting. So here's the deal. If you have a ship that's going where you've never been, you're not exactly sure what you're going to find. Who do you put on the ship? Obviously, you need someone to run the ship. That's 16 people. Keep it running. You know, don't run on the rocks. Keep us fed. All that sort of stuff. Then you naturally need a team of technicians to run all your toys. And we have a host of AUVs and RU ROVs and you name it Vs. My premier vehicle is Hercules with force feedback manipulators, stereo imaging systems, digitizing, all sorts of stuff. And it's controlled from this room. So this is the command control center board the Nautilus. We work 24-7. Four on, eight off watches, round the clock, round the clock. We don't stop once we get in the field. And we have pilots, co-pilots, navigators, all the engineers and everyone running all that stuff. But who is in charge? Who's the intellectual engine behind this? Normally, the intellectual engine sits here at this console. So there's a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, all sitting behind them, looking at the same thing they're looking at, and everyone has this audio display board. That's the magic. We have an audio display, I mean, a, 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 a display board that everyone can talk into, and by the way you hit the switches, you can create multiple conversations. Pilot, co-pilot, navigator talking to the bridge, launching the vehicles, uh, scientists talking to one another, educators talking to one another. So here's what, what we do is we then put, uh, I'll give you an example of some recent discoveries we were doing. Just to, so let me back up before I go into that. So here's, here's the promise we have made to our sponsor. That when we make a discovery, no matter when, no matter where, we will have the brightest people in America on that in 30 minutes. We will beam them to the bottom of the ocean in 30 minutes. And we do that by teleporting them moving them. Because we constantly are making discovery. We just, we just got back. We were out in the ship and we were doing all sorts of crazy things and we were doing a thing with National Geographic on the Battle of Gallipoli off of the, in the Aegean, uh, looking for these warships uh, from the time of uh, World War I and we found them and we're all sorts of cool. And we're looking, but what I love about what I do is most of the really important discoveries I made were done by accident looking for something else. I didn't expect to find those clams. I didn't expect to find those black smokers. There's so many of my discoveries that I did not, I stumbled on them. And here's another classic example. 
So National Geographic says, go find these warships. And we go, yeah, cool, we know sort of where they are. We'll mow the lawn, find them. So I'm going in here, and I'm trying to find a battleship called the HMS Triumph up here off Anzac Beach. And we found it, but as I was coming in on the area where the battleship was, I look over my sonar and I see this. I see a ring, a circular ring that's 45 meters across with a, some sort of structure in the middle. What is that? That is probably a site of human habitation 9,000 years ago when that particular piece of real estate was above water. A Neolithic site, one of the oldest now discovered. And we went down and walls of stone, we found 12 of them. We're heading back there to do some more on them in a few months. Completely out of the blue, what are you doing here? I'm looking for something. Another example, we were working in the Aegean. This is Crete. And if you know anything about your plate tectonics, the African continent is crashing into the Eurasian continent, leading to all the deformation of the Alps and that whole deformation belt, all the earthquakes in Iran and Turkey and all of that are of this collision, head-on collision, going on between Africa and the Eurasian plate. Well, behind it, when that, when that plate subducts down beneath the island of Crete, it gets down at a certain depth that melts and up comes those active volcanoes. Mount Fuji is a classic example, Mount, uh, Mount St. Helens. These are back arc volcanoes where that plate goes down, finally melts and comes up. So here's a famous one called Santorini. Now, Santorini is famous because during the Minoan civilization, about 1400 BC, this guy went off and it blew big time. And it buried an entire civilization called Akrotiri. We didn't know it was there until we were digging for the, getting uh, sand for the Suez Canal and we found a city. <laughs> okay. Well, off of it, just to the north, is a volcano we discovered that no one had ever been in. It's a flank eruption like Kilauea so on the Big Island. So we went down, we were the first people to go down inside that volcano. And it was Dante's Inferno when we got down in there. That thing is the entire floor is organic life. Entire floor of it is chemosynthetic bacterium, vast mats of it. And vent after vent after vent. Greece is very interested in knowing that they got a ticking time bomb in their backyard about six miles where, where everyone's sunbathing. So, want to see a new tsunami, that's the place. At, but we also discovered all of these chemosynthetic life forms. Another example, we were working down here off the island of Crete. We found a seamount called the Aristosthenes Seamount. And it was flat-topped. What are you doing flat-topped? And we found that it's a, a, a massive piece of limestone that's submerged. Remember, the Mediterranean used to be dry in the Miocene eight million years ago and filled back up during that fill up. And so we expected to go see a bunch of sinkholes and all that sort of stuff. Surprise, we came in on a phenomenal concentrations of life forms in the billions and billions of clams. Made the hydrothermal vents we discovered in 1977 look like a little divot in the size. They went on and on and on and on. The, the entire side of the mountain was leaking methane because that seamount was trying to be subducted beneath Cyprus and it was putting up a big fight. It didn't want to go down and it was being squeezed and it, methane was being squeezed out of it and we ha had no idea that was going on. And two worms again. Now, finally, what I want to concentrate on is how we're now turning this into educational experience. We, are, we have an inner space center in a Graduate School of Oceanography, URI. Just graduated two students and their PhDs, looking for some more. Do your earth sciences, guys. Uh, but this is our inner space center. We man it 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. So when we make a discovery, it's instantly seen in the inner space center immediately. We then go out on internet too to remote consoles. This I2, I2. I2 is the new internet. I2 makes the one you guys play on look like a dirt road on the information highway. You're still on a dirt road. I2 has 10 gigabits of bandwidth. You can replicate the entire command center on the ship on I2. And every university, including this one, is on I2. So we're building consoles all over the United States. So we can call a person and they walk down the hall from their lab and we teleport them onto the ship when they sit down at this console. We embed educators in every leg of our expeditions. We have Jason educators 
on our expeditions, embedded in the team. We have student Argonauts on our ships, and we have them ashore as well at their command centers. So they literally become a part of our team. They file stories. We have a great website, nautiluslive.org. We have, you go ask a question, we take thousands of questions because we have trapped scientists. You know, they can't get away. So you can ask them any time of day, 24 hours a day. You can ask a question, you'll get an answer. And we're also putting them in schools, at command centers. We're putting them in Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Put them all over the place. Because we're talking about the age of electronic travel. That's where we're headed. You will mostly not be moving your body around. You'll be moving your spirit around. Classrooms of tomorrow we're already building. And we're already giving people control of our vehicle system. I would not let an adult do this. They are totally unqualified. <laughs> they do not have the gaming experience to operate my vehicle systems. I'm sure that any one of you in a matter of five minutes could take command control of my vehicle system. Piece of cake. And that's what you're going to be doing, renting robots in the Serengeti for an afternoon drive amongst the cheetahs will be happening. And obviously, we're after that. So that's what we're all about. Uh, we're starting an honors program. I uh, would love to chat with you. The people over there would gladly talk to you about it. Uh, we're, we're taking students with directed research studies, embedding them in our academic program, and uh, fixing up your resume. Thank you very much. All right, I guess uh, we, got a, we got a couple minutes, so uh, are there any questions? By the way, the chief scientist of the Nautilus is, is a student of mine, Katie Croft. Katie uh, went to MIT, got her uh, uh, undergraduate degree at MIT in engineering. She then went off to England to Southampton University, got her master's in archaeology. She successfully defended her PhD uh, thesis. She's now Dr. Croft uh, last Friday, and she uh, did her PhD in, in geology and geophysics. So think about it. Undergraduate degree in engineering, master's in archaeology, PhD in geology and geophysics. All right. Quiet for a second. Question? I saw a hand. Yes. I mean to fake your mind. Uh, I mean to make your mind think your body's there. The idea, if you look at your brain, your brain's this, this, this thing, deaf, dumb, and blind, fed sensor information. And that's your eyes are telling it something, your nose is telling it something, your fingers are telling it something. So, so I'm just trying to trick your brain into thinking you are there. And the way you do that, most of your brain processes visual information. So what we try to do is to give you the sense that you're looking out of windows, when you're really looking at high def and, and, and soon 3D high def. So when you're looking, you think you're seeing. Well, you are. But your eyes are on a robot. So we're simply linking the eyes of the robot to your eyes. We do the same with the manipulators. The manipulators have to have what's called force feedback. They actually put up resistance. You can feel with them. So we're simply connecting the force feedback uh, sensors on the robot to your fingertips. So if we, just, if we just have an extended body. But your mind says, I feel, I see, I hear. It doesn't matter where my gallbladder is. No. Actually, it does matter. You don't want it there. You, you don't want your body is really limited on this planet. It's a highly limited thing. And so you say, well, I don't want, I, let's get out of here. It's, it's Avatar. OK, it's Avatar. That's, and we're here. We're, we're, we've arrived. It's not, I wonder. You know, I, I must say, though, uh, I have a little trouble sometimes knowing where I am uh, because when I'm really involved and I get up and walk to go to get a Coke or something and I find myself back in Connecticut and I say, well, wait a minute, I was, above, in the, I was just in the Mediterranean a second ago. And, and in fact, I, but I can put it on my iPhone. I can put it on my iPad. I can go around, where the heck are we? You know? I can talk to the ship. It's a local extension at the university. So all of a sudden, time just, I mean, distances just collapse. And that's cool because it's green. It doesn't take a lot of energy to move a spirit. It takes virtually none. So think about its economic, and, and economic value and in ecological value. Our biggest problem is we move gallbladders around. 
you know, and cars and airplanes. I mean, it's, why do you, the gallbladder just doesn't know where it is and doesn't really care. So get it out of the game. And as soon as you get it out of the game, all sorts of huge things happen. First place, you live where you want to live. I, I'm going home tonight. I'm going to my house. I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning. If it were, were you know, were Friday, it's, it is Friday, but it, I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning in my house and I, I work in my house and I finally reach a point where, you know, I think I need to see a human. I live in Connecticut and I periodically say, you know, yeah, let's go see if there, let's go see a human. And I get in my car and I drive down to a little store and I see a human and I come back, okay, that's cool. Uh, but I, <laughs> I really don't have to. <laughs> All my team, I, when's the last time I was over in the Jason offices? Like nine months ago, okay? Uh, I see my team once in a while. I don't care where they are. If they're in the matrix, that's all I care about. Uh, my son, who's uh, playing this game, he's uh, at a school called Choate. And uh, he's, uh, he's a junior at Choate. And uh, he's, he's at a school where there's tons of kids from all over the planet. And they go home for holidays and has kids from Japan and, 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 and China and France and all that. And they're doing their thing. And I walk into his room and I say, so what are you doing? Oh, I was with my buddies. I said, well, give me the latitude and longitude of where you are right now. He says, we don't have latitude and longitude. We're in the cloud. And so you're in the cloud. So, so get ready. It's going to be interesting. But the beauty of it is it will empower you like you've never been empowered. You're seeing the empowerment around the planet right now. Are we seeing a little empowerment going on amongst your, your generation? Now, enough of this, okay? So it's going to be amazing. I can't predict where it's going, folks. It's sort of out of control. The genie's out of the bottle. But I'm sort of optimistic. I, I have a great deal of faith in, in your generation, and I think you're going to do amazing things. I do know one thing for sure. Your generation will explore more of Earth than all previous generations combined. S let that sink in. Because of this technological leap, your generation will explore more of planet Earth than all previous generations combined. And I have no idea what you're going to find, but I can guarantee you there's lots of surprises out there. You're not a mop-up operation. You are the vanguard of explorers. So hopefully some of you will take an interest in what we do. We're always looking for good students. And uh, we hope some of you will get involved. Another question. Yes? Uh, how does a chemosynthetic organism get energy? From the oxidation of H2S, it releases energy. It oxidizes hydrogen sulfide and in that gets a, a, a energy uh, uh, of that combination and then it fixes, it takes the carbon and oxygen and fixes it's carbon dioxide and oxygen and creates a carbon-based food system. So it's doing it off the chemical energy of the planet, not the solar energy of outer space. Yes? Um, do you think we have like underwater cities soon? Underwater cities? No, I don't, it's dark. <laughs> it's dark. I mean that's the last place I want to send anybody. Could penal colony maybe, put our prisons down there. But, um, <laughs> no. I think we're going to live on the ocean. I think that's no doubt about it. We're going to live on the ocean, but, and we may live. I, I've been designing a futuristic home, for sort of cool. I'm working with, we're going to, we got a TV series with Geographic coming out. We're going to have it in there. But I did a, a recent program on PBS on uh, American Experience with uh, Alan Alda. And, and what I did is I took a, if you take a, 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 a pen, you have a pencil or something like a pencil? Where's a pencil? Who's got a pencil? So just give me something that's, there we go, I got it. So if you, if you take this, okay, and you uh, weight it at one end, take a pencil, for example, that normally would float in water. Take a pencil, float it in water, put a little lead on it, and it'll flip. Okay, as soon as you flip that guy, you can't move it much. Uh, it is extremely stable. So when you send a wave at that, it'll move one-tenth the amplitude of the wave. So a 30-foot wave will cause that to go about three feet vertically. And that's what the oil companies have done. If you look at their offshore platforms, they've basically taken, they call spar buoys, they're called spar buoys. And if you take a, a four of them and put them together, you can then build a platform on it, and that's what the oil companies do. But they, those platforms don't move a lot because you can't excite that, that pencil because it's so, very little cross-section and tremendous amount of displacement. So you can't move it. So I'm going to design a, and they actually have, if you go on the web, uh, go to Scripps in La Jolla, they have a ship called the Flip. And it's a cool ship. It's down in La Jolla. 
I mean, actually down in San, downtown San Diego. And what they do is all, the engine room and the beds and everything in it are gimbaled. So they tow it out like this and then they flip it. And it, it's a, like, you know, a seventh above water. It's about 350 feet. Okay, so, so it, what's cool about that is you get, you get air, you get the cool part of the sunlit layer, and then you're getting it deep enough to get down near the thermocline where it's cold, so you can get a geothermal gradient going for air conditioning. And it doesn't move, and it can rotate and keep solar panels constantly receiving light, total efficiency, because it's tracking with the sun, and there's no trees around. And then it can aquaculture on the side. So you can have a completely self-sustained living system, and then when you want to you can go ashore, I mean, Los Angeles, you need 300, 350 feet of water to flip, but if you live off Los Angeles, where I grew up, there's lots of water deep, and you've got a nice skylight, you just don't have to deal with all that craziness. But you can helicopter ashore, go shopping, and then when they want, you can be a snowbird, and they can tow it down to Baja, California, while you're on vacation, they flip it back, and you, you know. So it's, I, that's the kind of living I see, is living uh, in those kinds of situations. Uh, any other questions? How's our time? Yes, she's going for a twofer. Someone's okay. pen. So you were talking about the bacteria that um, figured out how to uh, do photosynthesis in the dark. Um, did you take it to the surface and expose it to sun at all? And if so, what happened? Yes, we brought up the bacterium. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter a whole lot to them. Uh, uh, what we do is, what we're really interested in these bacteria, we've isolated about 250 of them is that they're pr processing toxins. I mean, a geothermal vent is a toxic waste dump if it was on land, you build a fence around it. It's got lots of carcinogenics, it's got lots of heavy metals, it's not healthy. And you say, well, wait a minute, what do you mean it's not healthy? It's seething with life. Yeah, but they, they figured out how to live with it. Idea, can I take these guys and bioengineer them and have them eat our waste? Is this a biological alchemy? Can I actually engineer them? We're now doing it with oil spills, getting bacterium that love oil spills. They eat them. Okay. So can we isolate these bacterium and have them take what we think is really awful and make it into something that's really nice? The answer is probably. So that's what's got me more interested, is how do these guys live in this really awful environment and are happy? and make clams, you know, can we sort of make a clam that then sort of doesn't look as ugly and we can make it a prettier clam and then we can eat it, you know? So I, I'm very optimistic that there's a lot, of, a lot of those kinds of things that we'll figure out. There's so much life we've yet to discover that has been, is very clever and we, once we learn what they can do, we can, we can take it to our advantage. So I'm very, I just see all sorts of, for example, you know, fisheries, we say we, you know, we are definitely stressing the planet's fishery. But I had a slide in an earlier presentation where I showed the seamounts. We've located about 10,000 seamounts on our planet and the ocean, and we find them all coated with rare elements like, uh, like uh, uh, cobalt, which is a strategic metal, is all over, uh, on these seamounts. We find very interesting depositions on these seamounts, but at the top of the seamounts, we find aggregation of fish. They, they like to sit on tops of seamounts because of the upwelling, the nutrients caused by the seamount. The ocean goes by it, it pushes the nutrients up, and so they like it. We think there's over 100,000 undiscovered seamounts in the ocean. Well, that could be a lot of fish. We're also looking at the, the history. I didn't go into the work I'm doing in the Black Sea where I'm finding perfectly preserved ships because of the anoxia of the Black Sea. The Black Sea has no oxygen. It's the biggest reservoir of hydrogen sulfide on Earth. It's 2,000 meters deep, and, and the ships of antiquity are perfectly preserved. I, too bad, I just didn't have time to show you all that stuff. But we have beautiful, and that's where we'll be live. Watch us July 22nd on. We'll be in the Black Sea looking for those guys, and we're going to find them. What we're also looking for is, uh, in addition to uh, the shipwrecks, but the shipwrecks are so perfectly preserved, the crew members should be perfectly cr preserved with all their DNA. And we're talking way back thousands and thousands of years of human history. So we think there's a million ships of antiquity undiscovered in the ocean. There's more history in the deep sea than all the museums of the world combined. Your generation will find that lost history. No doubt about it. Because it's getting, we now know how to find it. 
I'm finding now ancient shipwrecks every 11 hours once I get underwater. And we'll be doing that in August. Watch that. We'll be uh, shipwreck hunting off of the Ionian coast of Turkey, off of ancient Holoconossus, where Herodotus was born. The great Greek colonies of Kenidos and Holoconossus, and shipwrecks all over the place. Once you get below the trawlers, we've discovered you got to get below the trawlers. If you did this, saw that program we did on 60 Minutes, go to 60 Minutes, Robert Ballard, you'll see the program of cracking that code, figuring out where these guys are, finding out that the ancient mariners drove deep water trade routes, but they threw their litter overboard. Their amphoras, their amphoras marked the trails. You pick up the trails, you pick up the shipwrecks. Piece of cake once you crack the code. The first one's hard, the second one's a little harder, the third one's easy, and then it's a slaughter. We are finding them like crazy. And uh, that's why some of our, our, our students get degrees, du dual degrees in uh, Mike Brennan, who was a Jason Argonaut. Mike Brennan went to Bowdoin, got a double degree, geology, archeology, span has a master's now in archeology, span get his PhD in geology next year. We want you to be fluid. We want you to, you know, you're in school right now and you have a golden opportunity to eat anything you can eat. I look at education like going into a supermarket. I never thought I'd ever eat sushi when I was a young kid. I love sushi. Okay. I never thought I would eat snails till I went to France and found that it was really the garlic and the butter. But you hear courses and you say, sounds like snails, you know, until you taste it. You have a chance now, like you will never ever have the rest of your life, is to go through the supermarket of education and taste as many things as humanly possible. And you're gonna find you have a particular appetite that's unique. And by what you eat in your mind, you will become a unique person. But you only can become unique by trying everything and finding that particular smorgasbord of things you like and that will make you definingly unique. And it better be something you love. Do not do it because your parents said to do it. Absolute, get good grades, but do not do what your parents want you to do or what your teacher, do what you want to do. Because here's what's going to happen. I don't care how good a student you are, you're going to hit a wall periodically. I don't care a hoot how good you think you are. You're going to fail at something. And it's going to knock you down. And you're going to question what you're doing. And what's going to get you up is your passion to do it. That's going to get you up and say, I'm go at it again. I remember the first time I went after the Bismarck. I did not find it. I spent a lot of National Geographic memberships on that one. Okay, and I, coming back, they had the cameraman on me, you know, can't, you gotta live with him. And they said, so how do you feel? Well, I feel wonderful, I didn't find it, you know. I've, of course, I've, you know, I, but I said, I looked at the camera and I said, round one to the Bismarck, I know where it isn't. <laughs> and I'll get it the next time, and I got it the next time. But I had the passion to get it, or I could have quit. So follow your dreams, no one else's. Thank you.